Hi, my name is Sean Joseph. I am the Vice President of Pharmacology at Caliber, a division of Scripps Research. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as the drug development arm of Scripps Research. Um, today, I want to talk to you about immunomodulatory approaches to neurodegeneration. And neuroinflammation is associated with Parkinson's disease as well as other neurodegenerative conditions. And this neuroinflammation results in the presence of activated microglia that contribute to an inflammatory microenvironment within the brain. The pro-inflammatory environment, this pro-inflammatory environment leads to dopaminergic neuronal cell death. Um, interestingly and importantly, peripheral administration of GMCSF leads to uh, neuroprotection and decreased microgliosis through a number of potential immune-mediated mechanisms. Treatment with GMCSF may result in the generation of tolerogenic dendritic cells that can indirectly induce regulatory T cell populations. It can, they, it can also direct induction of immunosuppressive regulatory T cell populations themselves. And also they could potentially um, shift the overall CD4 positive T cell subsets into a more anti-inflammatory phenotype. And importantly, following peripheral immune alterations and cell inductions, regulatory T cells and or anti-inflammatory CD4 positive T cells can cross the blood brain barrier into sites of inflammation and restore the brain's microenvironment into one that is more neurotrophic and anti-inflammatory, leading to increased neuronal survival and health. And importantly, this, this is true for Parkinson's disease, but it's true for many other neurodegenerative diseases as well, such as Alzheimer's disease, ALS. It's even been shown to play important roles in MS. Um, and then outside of, of neurodegenerative diseases, there are other indications for which this mechanism seems to be important, including um, acute radiation syndrome, autoimmune diseases, lung disease, and Crohn's disease. Um, and so what we focused on at the moment is Parkinson's disease. Um, but there are obvious, you know, other indications that we're also pursuing that we're not going to necessarily cover today. And so what we what we found was that, you know, GMCSF is a is a very interesting target. It's been shown preclinically to modulate that that in, immune or that inflamed microenvironment that I just mentioned. It modulates the innate microglial immunity and then increases regulatory T cells that then make their way into the from the periphery into the brain, resulting in an anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective phenotype. And this, some of the data preclinically that has demonstrated a, a very interesting effect of GMCSF treatment. And if you look at the top right, these are many different labs demonstrating preclinically in animal models of Parkinson's disease that GMCSF treatment increases T regulatory cells dose dependently. And then that it then leads to an increased dopaminergic neuron and improves overall locomotor activity in, in Parkinson's disease models. And it, importantly, as I mentioned earlier, the effect is not only you know, for Parkinson's disease, but other neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. GMCSF treatment in animals has shown has reversed cognitive impairment in those animals and reduced amyloid burden in, a, in an animal model of Alzheimer's disease. And what really led us to looking at GMCSF as a potential target, and I, I should have mentioned that essentially what we're doing is taking GMCSF and making it into a longer acting version of GMCSF so that you know, we can overcome many of the inherent limitations of, of the currently marketed drug, Sargramostim or Leukine. Um, and what really drew us to this, to, this, um, to this indication and to this therapeutic as a target is work that was done in Howard Gendelman's lab in which he and, and Parkinson's disease patients demonstrated clinical proof of concept for the idea around GMCSF treatment, increasing T regulatory cells and then improving disease in Parkinson's disease patients. Um, interestingly, in, in a phenotype of Parkinson's disease patients as, as well as other diseases such as ALS and, and Alzheimer's is that these patients have abnormal T cell phenotypes and this is true in terms of the number of, of T regulatory cells that are present in the, in, in the body, but also the function of them is, is dysregulated. And this dysregulation correlates very closely with the pathology and the disease severity of these neurodegenerative diseases. 
And so, as I mentioned in Howard Gentleman's lab, he was able to demonstrate clinically that, that leukine or sargamostin was able to increase T-regulatory cells and improve motor function in Parkinson's disease patients. And when you talk to Dr. Gendelman about these, about these results, the, the effects are dramatic. He was talking about patients who were wheelchair bound being able to walk or patients who weren't able to thrive being able to drive or mow the lawn, things that their, their daily independence dramatically increased as a result of treatment with this you know, clinically available GMCSF. Unfortunately, leukine or sargamostum is inherently limited by the fact that it has a very short half-life, a very rapid clearance. And so the, the molecule only sticks around in the body for, you know, this half-life is one to three hours. And so there's a requirement that you need daily subcutaneous injections. And this can be very difficult for a patient with Parkinson's disease, as you can imagine, to self-administer. Um, and so this was a, an opportunity in our eyes. We, we saw this as, a, as an opportunity to develop a long-acting GMCSF that then you could dose subcutaneously one to twice per month, and that this would likely increase efficacy, improve compliance, and have relatively fewer side effects as, as, the, um, as the peptide itself. And as I mentioned, that the neurodegeneration or the neuroinflammation and its impact on neurodegeneration is, is generalizable in the sense that there's been uh, many results demonstrated in, in multiple labs showing that even in, say, ALS, in this particular context, that T regulatory cells are able to extend stable disease phase and prolong survival in these animal models. This can be done by transferring T regulatory cells, as you see in the top right of this graph, and or you can also treat with a therapeutic that upregulates T regulatory cells. In this case, it's IL-2, but obviously GMCSF is something that would also do this, and we're going to demonstrate that in a collaboration with Columbia University. But at this point, the data that exists is, is, is shown here, and it demonstrates a significant prolongation of survival upon upregulation of T regulatory cells by a molecule that you're treating the animals with. And this has been also extended into the clinic. In ALS patients, just as in Parkinson's disease, these disease patients, these patients have low levels of T regulatory cells and they have dysfunctional regulatory T cells. And those dysfunctional T regulatory cells correlate very closely with the ALS pathology and disease severity as well. And so those, interestingly, T regs with that impaired suppressive function, they function normally when the cells were taken out and expanded. And infusions of those expanded T regulatory cells, which had restored function, they, those, when you put them back into patients, were safe, they were well tolerated. And then the numbers in the suppressive function increased after the infusion. And across a range of disease states within ALS, disease progression dramatically slowed during these infusions of T regulatory cells, but then rapidly increased following cessation, suggesting that continuous production of T regulatory cells is necessary to capitalize on this phenomenon. And uh, hence, again, a significant opportunity exists for a long-acting GMCSF that would be expected to sustainably increase T regulatory cells and hence slow ALS disease progression. And we believe that a long-acting GMCSF that can be dosed subcutaneously once or twice a month would be preferred versus repeated T reg expansions and reinfusions, which is cumbersome and difficult to scale. Now, how do you make it a long-acting GMCSF? Well, it turns out that you know, a, an invention, a discovery at Scripps Research enabled this in the sense that well, I think it was probably at this point, you know, almost a, de a decade ago, um, it, was, it was found by Scripps researchers. They identified a unique bovine antibody that had this ultra-long CDRH3 region. And on the end of that CDRH3 region was a knob-like domain presented at the end of an anti-parallel beta stock. This really was very interesting. You could replace that knob-like domain with a therapeutic peptide or a therapeutic protein. And then you could get rid of the bovine portion of the antibody and replace it with a human scaffold, one that preferably had already been in the clinic and demonstrated low immunogenicity and, and tolerability. And then you can optimize that protein and that fusion protein, essentially, and this results in, in a molecule that retains the wild type potency of that peptide that you fused in. And then it allows you to have the extended pharmacokinetics that you're looking for, that long acting characteristic, 
and hence the persistent pharmacodynamics. And in the context of GNCSF, this is obviously T regulatory cell upregulation. And importantly, this fully recombinant molecule has a developability and manufacturing um, consideration that, that mirrors monoclonal antibodies. It's, a, it's as easy to produce as it is to produce a typical monoclonal antibody. So obviously this, this early discovery at Scripps research really revolutionized how you can make a peptide longer acting and it inspired the generation of a new class of antibody agonists and antagonists with excellent pharmacology and manufacturability. Now, some of the data around our long-acting GM-CSF fusion protein, what, what we call PDM-608, we can, we've made it, we've fused it into a couple of human backbones, Synagis and Herceptin, and we've looked at others as well, but we found these to be suitable. Um, these are both antibodies that have been in the clinic for years, and so we very much understand what they do in people. Um, and so we spent a lot of time from a protein engineering standpoint, optimizing the expression yield, the stability, the low inherent immunogenicity, and essentially tinkering with the protein to make the longest acting version of the peptide that would also be low in terms of its immunogenicity risk and it would extend that serum half-life. Um, we also reduced you know, the FC mutations that were incorporated it's so that we could reduce the ADCC and CDC and the overall immunogenicity of the protein. Now, as you can see here, we are able to um, get a molecule that is a peak molar potent in our, for our antibody fusion, our long-acting GMCSF. And when we put that molecule into animals, it had a half-life of approximately 200 hours compared to one to three hours in, in, for wild-type GMCSF. Now, we put this molecule into this optimized lead candidate into animal models of Parkinson's disease. And what we saw is that you get a nice dose dependent increase in T regulatory cells. And importantly, those T regulatory cell numbers were increasing, but that's not all. We also had an improvement in T regulatory function. So we have a molecule now that compared to the wild type peptide is much more potent in inducing the uh, T regulatory numbers and also improving its function of those T regulatory cells. In the same animal model, we were able to demonstrate that you get a reduction in that, in that, pro, in that in inflammatory milieu in the brain and in terms of this animal model, we're able to reduce the microgliosis that is, is part of the pathology for this um, disease. And then we're able to protect overall the dopaminergic neurons. And this is all, um, incredibly important for a molecule to be able to do in order to improve uh, neurodegenerate disease. Now, we went on further to demonstrate that the way that our molecule is working is through essentially shifting that CD4 T cell population into an anti-inflammatory population of cells or a phenotype. And this is what we think is, is resulting in the dampening of the inflammation in the brain. Now, really importantly for a long-acting molecule is durability. And we see with a single dose of our molecule, and we've seen this now in rodents, and we've seen it in Cinemologous monkey, that if a single dose of, of GNCSF, of PDM608 specifically, results in a reduct, an increase of up to 20-fold in T regulatory cells and increases their function in, in data that I, have not, that I showed earlier. And importantly, the increase in T regulatory cells lasts for approximately 12 days following a single treatment. And it was well tolerated in, in non-human primates and mice. Now, next steps for the program is, you know, we want, we're very interested in developing this for Parkinson's disease, for Alzheimer's disease, and for ALS. And so we're working on getting this, the preclinical data to support the ALS program. And so we worked closely with, uh, the core at Columbia and the, the ALS, Project ALS Therapeutics Corps at Columbia University with the world experts in ALS. And they're helping us to, to design and also execute on these animal models of disease, but also they're helping us to translate that into something clinically, clinically meaningful and, and do a clinical study design and potentially partner with us to, to put this molecule into humans in the future. And to give you a little more granular feel for where we are is these are all the development activities that are ongoing in order to result in an IND submission by the end of 2021 this year. And we hope to get into a healthy volunteer patient or healthy volunteer population by the 
beginning of 2022. And we then want to roll right into an ALS and a Parkinson's disease phase two clinical trial and waste no time. I want to thank all of the all of you for listening to my, my presentation and for and for learning more about our, our ongoing project, which is very exciting to us. And we also want to thank all of these folks who made this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you.